I'm going to encourage a little change. We're going to have our attention drawn to the screen up front and those who are on the periphery, you really, I think are going to want to move because this is going to be my message tonight with you having the focus on the screen. So please feel free, adjust chairs. I let your neck be comfortable, <laughs> but I'm not going to be up front. So um, just, you know, make sure you can see the screen and see it well. You're not going to want to stand the whole time. So I'm gonna give you a minute. Um, I'll just whet your appetite. Bruce, you said we always have a question and you didn't give a question. I'll give a question. Okay. What's important for men's <laughs> <laughs> And I'll also give an answer. <laughs> so, Is this going to be in the way? Yeah. No. Okay, right? She's okay? Okay. I have a Okay. 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 Yeah. When everybody has, do you really want to stand for a long time? Coffee? I'm tired. It'll be a long time. It'll be long time. <laughs> I'm short, but my, my talk is a two year old. You're inspired you want to go out. We can bring another chair around or right. someone else. You know, there's an extra chair. Okay. And I know the sun got cold, including me, but we have adjusted the air, so you need to move for that. We're just slightly, we're almost there. Okay. If that's going to work, it's probably not going to be. <laughs> there we go. Okay. All right. What is the importance of Israel? I'm going to ask for our lights to go out. I hope everyone, oh, wait a minute, let's let Jim leave. Um, I don't want anybody tripping because I turn the lights on. That could be a good tradition. Okay. Oh, oh boy. Are we good? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Good. <laughs> this story was originally published in Israel Today, World News Daily, and other news sources. It took place during Operation Protective Edge, and this is from an eyewitness account. A missile was fired from Gaza. Iron Dome precisely calculated the trajectory. We know where these missiles are going to land down to a radius of 200 meters. This particular missile was going to hit either the Azraeli Towers the Kirya, which is Israel's equivalent of the Pentagon, or a central Tel Aviv railway station. Hundreds could have died. We fired the first interceptor. It missed. Second interceptor. It missed. This is very rare, and I was in shock. At this point, we had just four seconds until the missile lands. We had already notified emergency services to converge on the target location and had warned of a mass casualty incident. Suddenly, Iron Dome, which calculates wind speeds among other things, shows a major wind coming from the east, a strong wind that sends the missile into the sea. <laughs> we were we were all stunned. I stood up and shouted, there is a God. <laughs> I witnessed this miracle with my own eyes. It was not told or reported to me. I saw the hand of God send that missile into the sea. Amen. Amen. Does Israel matter? What is the importance of Israel? Israel is a tiny nation in the heart of the Middle East. She's the geopolitical center of the world. She's positioned on an ancient land bridge and a trade route that connects Africa, Asia, and Europe. Politically speaking, she's the only safe place for a Jew to live as a Jew. Possibly the United States also, but that even <laughs> in places is questionable nowadays. And Golda Meir said, that's our secret weapon. We have nowhere else to go. <laughs> it's also interesting, uh, side note, that it's the only country in the Middle East where the Arab Christian can live, can worship in freedom, can prosper economically, 
this takes place solely and only in Israel. Israel is the sole democracy. I told you, I'm sorry, she's a geopolitical center of the world if I didn't say that, but she's also the only, the sole democracy in the Middle East. And she is our closest ally. Uh, we have a moral responsibility really to stand with Israel, with her, since she is democratic, and we need to realize the value of our militaries that are intertwined with each other. She really is our closest and our only ally. Yeah. There are so many advantages to this alliance between the United States and Israel. We saw the destruction of some of the Iraqi uh, nuclear abilities back in the 80s, and we soon may see a repeat there. But as Yoram Edinger, who is an Israeli diplomat, he is a consultant to Israeli and U.S. legislatures. He's an expert on U.S.-Israel relations. He uh, deals with the Middle East affairs. There, I could go on and on. And he said, and I quote, and this is from our year. This actually was last week. The U.S. does not give foreign aid to Israel. The U.S. makes an annual investment in Israel, mm -hmm. giving U.S. taxpayers a return of several hundred percent. Israel serves as a battle-tested, cost-effective laboratory for the U.S. defense and aerospace industries. The Israel Air Force flies Lockheed Martin's F-16 F-35 combat aircraft, providing Lockheed Martin and the U.S. Air Force with invaluable information on operations, maintenance, and repairs, which is then used to manufacture a multitude of upgrades. The mm -hmm. F-16 has been improved by several hundred Israeli-driven upgrades, sparing Lockheed Martin years of research and development amounting to billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. Israeli experts have also trained U.S. personnel in neutralizing car bombs, suicide bombers, and IEDs. According to the late Senator Daniel Inouye, Chairman of the Senate Appropriations and Intelligence Committee, the scope of Israeli intelligence shared with the U.S. exceeded that provided by all NATO countries combined. Mm -hmm. Israeli intelligence helped foil sinister plots against U.S. airliners and airports and provided vital data on advanced Soviet-Russian military systems. Mm -hmm. Netanyahu said back in 2014, and it's even more relevant to today, that this danger that we see in the Middle East is a pathological movement that is sweeping our area, but it's soon coming to a theater near you. The one standing in front now of this tsunami is Israel. Support Israel, support yourself. Mm -hmm. Israel is a rock-strewn landscape. If you haven't seen Israel, she's full of rocks. <laughs> So we call her a rock-strewn landscape that at its longest and widest point is 260 miles long and 60 miles wide at most. On this platform, the most important drama of history has played before watching world. And in modern times, we've seen Entebbe. We've seen Operation Moses. We've seen so much more. Yet Israel also, at her narrowest, is just nine miles wide. And this is why she has to keep such a close eye on her enemy and why she cannot give up strategic land points that the world asks her to do. Israel is a land of extremes. We have donkeys and camels <laughs> right next to automobiles, and we'll see skyscrapers. <laughs> Israel has mountains. 7,297 feet high, and we can go down to the lowest, the Dead Sea, 1,400 feet below sea level. Israel also happens to be surrounded by 22 Arab nations, and she is so small that you can't put her name on the map where her geographic location is because mm -hmm. you're out of room before you're out of letters, and Israel isn't that long of a name. <laughs> Israel also, with it inside our state of New Jersey, with 200 square miles to spare. 19 Israels would fit in California. Two Israels inside the San Bernardino County, and it's barely twice the size of LA County. Boiling it down, Israel is one tenth of 1% 1 of the landmass of the Middle East. Did you get that? One tenth of 1%. Yet, Israel dominates the news. 
for both old reasons, yay, <laughs> and new reasons. And the world feels compelled to watch Israel to protect their own interests. It's also very much in the news for the fear, but it's also because there is a romance. There is an inexpressible affection that, that just intrinsically, I can't talk tonight, <laughs> so he draws us to the land. And we see the love of that land so dear to so many hearts, yet it's also a land of tragedy. It's a land of immeasurable pain. No other nation has risen so high. No other nation has suffered such lows. It is technologically advanced. It has the highest number of scientists, technicians, engineers per capita in the world. On the NASDAQ, Israel has between 90 and 100 companies. It is third to the United States, China, and then Israel. <clears throat> it is a world leader in env environmental research, and it's disproportionately per capita recognized in literature, in the sciences, in art, in music, and in medicine. Israel contributes in agriculture, computer science, electron studies, genetics, healthcare, optics, solar energy, engineering, I could go on and on. But as I said, Israel also has sent so low, so low that she's gone into captivity repeatedly through time, and it always is because she forgets her God. No other people have been dispersed and scattered among the nations of the world and then regathered into their ancestral homeland. We see that in 1600, 1% of the Jewish population resided in Israel. By 1991, 32%. And by today, we have 50% of the world Jewry living in Israel. They're approximately 7 million strong, 75% of Israel's population, and they outnumber the U.S. now. We have 6 million. They have 7 million. <laughs> Interesting. So why is Israel, the people, important? That's because they're chosen by God. They're chosen to bring salvation to the world. They're chosen to bring forth the Messiah. This is the people chosen by God to tell the whole world about the God of gods, about the King of kings. This is to be the kingdom of priests. This is to be the mouthpiece of God to the nations. And the land chosen is to show the people of all nations the God who offers ultimate satisfaction, the God who offers security is to anyone who will put their trust in him. He keeps his promises. God connects himself with no other nation on the face of the earth but Israel. And in the holy word of God, Israel is mentioned, or the name appears, 2,566 times. Well, I think that beats your 17. Not, <laughs> Israel is the most frequently mentioned subject <laughs> other than the Lord in our scriptures. So Israel is critical, and she's critical to the rest of the world. God promised salvation for the world comes through the Messiah of Israel. And I want to point out very clearly the Christian faith, the belief is rooted in the promises of God that were given to Israel. Mm -hmm. Christianity is not a pagan religion, nor did its original ideas come from idolatrous beliefs or from other empires. It came strictly from the Jewish roots. And it's the promises of the God of Israel that is the basis of what we call Judeo Christianity. Mm -hmm. Yeshia, our prophet Isaiah, chapter 42 and verse 1 says, Here is my servant whom I support, my chosen one in whom I take pleasure. I put my spirit on him. He will bring justice to the going or to the Gentiles. And verse 6 says, I, yes, I am Adonai. Beside me there is no deliverer. I, yes, I am the one who blots out your offenses for my own sake. I will not remember your sins. And I stand corrected. I read one and six earlier. This is chapter 43. And hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Amen. Salvation is of the Jews. Amen. It is their Messiah who is procured literally for all of mankind. The salvation that came because the physical appearance of Yeshua in Israel brought salvation to the world. 
No other nation has done as much to provide a stage and a backdrop for the greatest story ever told, that of the first coming of the Messiah. He was born in Bethlehem. He was raised in Nazareth. He lived out his early, earthly mission in the Galilee and in Jerusalem, where he willingly shed his innocent, sinless blood that all who believe in his death his burial, and hallelujah, his resurrection should escape eternal suffering. And if you don't know, that's the empty tomb. <laughs> no other nation is promised deliverance from her enemies, promised Messiah ruling and reigning over the entire world from her capital named Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Just as Israel provided a stage and a backdrop for Messiah's first coming, Israel will again provide a stage and a backdrop for Messiah's second coming. He will, real, he will rule and reign from Jerusalem. We read that in Tehillim in Psalm chapter 2, verses 6 through 9. We read it in Yeshia, Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. Israel will be the head nation through whom the rest of the nations of the world will receive blessing. Zechariah, Zechariah, our prophet, tells us that in chapter 14 and verse 17. But between these two momentous events, the most important to mankind between the first coming and the second coming is a period of 2,000 plus years. And that's where we find ourselves awaiting today. In that span of time, Israel was and Israel is God's time clock. The Hebrew people are God's timepiece of the ages. Mm -hmm. And we know that we're on the timeline. We know where we are on the timeline of mankind in relation to what is happening to Israel. That's why we say that's the importance of Israel. It affects the world. First, we say that Israel, the land, is important. Then we claim that Israel, the people, are important. And this brings us to my next point, and that is why Israel, the people in the land, are of importance. And the first and foremost reason is it's fulfilled prophecy. Fulfilled mm -hmm. prophecy of the past begs for the fulfillment of all prophecy of the future. And the existence of Israel today as a people, the fact there is a Jew, the fact there is the people called Israel, the fact that they're in the land. Well, I give you exhibit A in the lineup of convincing evidences that biblical prophecies concerning the future ahead of us will be fulfilled just as they were in the past. Mm -hmm. Because we know that God promised Israel would be a nation. The Messiah could not return if Israel was not a people and a land for him to return to. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the prophetic clock regarding the return of the Messiah began ticking again in 1948. And for those who've been with me, I say, Talk, talk, <laughs> Therefore, this prophetic clock regarding the return of Messiah, foretold by the prophets, the future of Israel, it will be fulfilled, and we see it because we see the present fulfilling what was already foretold. And that's why we read our newspapers with, well, we'll put the newspaper on one hand, Here's our people at the wall praying. We'll put the newspaper in one hand and the Bible in the other hand. All the prophecies that relate to Israel, we can expect to be literally fulfilled. Mm -hmm. And these prophecies, as they're being fulfilled, are referred to as signs of the times. And you hear that often because as we keep that in mind, we're going to take a quick peek at Israel, at her history, because she is the key past present, and future. And this is beautifully laid out for us in Scripture. And by the way, Scripture just happens to be Israel's history book, if you haven't caught that by now. <laughs> A summary of this is given in Romans 9, Israel past, Romans 10, Israel present, and Romans 11, Israel future. The ancient nation of Israel began with one man, as recorded in the very first book, Bereshit, in the book of Genesis, in the beginning. God blessed Abraham because of his faith, and God promised that he, his descendants would form a great nation, and God was faithful to keep that promise. 
over an expanse of about 2100 years, I'm sorry, about 1200 years, from 2100 BC to 931 BC, Avraham's descendants, the Israelites, settled in the promised land. Mm -hmm. Yeshua, Joshua 21, 41 says, So Adonai gave Israel all the land which he swore to give to the, their ancestors, and they took possession of it, and they lived in it. Other prophecies being fulfilled show how important God believes Israel to be. And if it's important to God, I think it's important to us. Mm -hmm. It ought to be. Again, God identifies himself with Israel. Over 342 times in scripture, he calls himself by this name, whether it's the God of Israel, the Holy One of Israel, the Lord God of Israel, 342 times, that's his identity. Mm -hmm. And we know God has a special love for Israel. Davarim Deuteronomy 7, 8 says, the Lord left you. Yeshaya, our prophet Isaiah 63 and verse 7 says, I will mention the loving kindness of the Lord and the praises of the Lord according to all that the Lord has bestowed on us. Your man, Jeremiah 31, 3, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Yes. God has given her land that he calls his own. And he's given the parameters. It's not for man to decide. God gave them. In, Jer in Genesis, Bereshit, chapter 15 and verse 18, and believe me, they are far larger than that little dot I showed you in the beginning of my presentation. It will take in the expanse, including Egypt, including uh, the Saudi Arabia area, going up north, it, it takes in Syria, Lebanon, Turkey, part of Iraq and Iran. It, it's, it's huge. It goes to the rivers that uh, are beyond what I've been given in my description. This is what God promised. And he said in the Akra, Leviticus 25, we're almost there in our parashas. Verse 23, he calls it his own. He says, it belongs to me. And if it belongs to God, he can give it to whosoever he Amen. desires. Mm -hmm. Israel did go on to become a formidable and a wealthy nation under the rule of Melch David, King David, and his successor, Melch Shlomo, King Solomon. And to her we see promise, the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God and the promises of God. Hers is a rich heritage, and it's in the physical. The greatest privilege was that she was given the very word of God. She was to share this with the nations. And she was also given the promise of Messiah, which again, was to be Israel's gift to share with the rest of the world. She's a privileged people with a great promise, actually with great promises. However, sadly, over time, the Jewish races turned their back on God. They began worshiping pagan gods that they learned about from neighboring countries, and God warned his people repeatedly through the prophets. He would scatter the Israelites out of their land if they continued in such idolatry. Davarim, Deuteronomy 4.27 said, Adonai will scatter you among the peoples, among the nations to which Adonai will lead you away. You will be left few in number. And if that does not describe Israel and her history, sadly. Failing to heed these warnings and these messages, God did allow the Assyrians, later the Babylonians, to defeat Israel. The Jews were taken from their land as slaves in 586 B.C., and with consecutive conquests, we see that they fell under the oppression of Persia, of Greece, and we finally saw them under Rome fall. This is one of the pictographs on the Arch of Titus, the Arch of Triumph. I showed you that arch last week. I, I, t for those who weren't there, I'll tell you about that in a moment. But this depicts the carrying mm -hmm. off of the temple treasures because Titus thought he had won victory. He thought there would be no Jew left, that he had brought them all out of Israel. They were his slaves now, and they would die off in Rome. And that's why last week I showed you a picture where two of us put our four feet, <laughs> Jewish blood, <laughs> pointing back toward Israel rather than away from Israel and declaring, no, Titus, you didn't get us all. <laughs> God had his hand. Oh, okay. Well, you can show up later if you want. Roger's saying he's got it on the desktop. But uh, the point going on right now is though many looked at Israel as a favored nation, 
She seemed destined throughout the pages of the Bible for trouble and for international conflict. And this is true and being played out on the headlines of yesterday, today, and is prophesied of tomorrow. While under Roman oppression, the promise of Messiah's first coming was fulfilled. Even under Roman oppression, don't miss that. Sadly, though, it was only a remnant that received this truth. Israel expecting her Messiah to come in his kingly role did not take to the humble, to the one who came in riding lowly and on a donkey. And rejecting him, they rejected him coming in the role of taking our sin, being the sin sacrifice, so that we can have forgiveness for our sin. Later, he will come in the kingly role. He will establish his kingdom as has been promised. And we'll talk more about that when we get to the future. But sadly, by not accepting their Messiah, Romans 9 declares that they stumbled. But it says they stumbled so as not to fall. What does this mean? What this means is that in their stumbling, stumbling, God would call out another people. He would call out a Gentile people. He would fulfill what he had ordained from the beginning. You see, it wasn't plan B. It didn't catch God by surprise. He knew what was going to happen. And all along, he had planned on bringing the Gentile people in. But did that mean that at this point now he was done with the Jew? That he was hostile toward the Jew? That he was indifferent toward the Jew? But remember the words stumbled so as not to fall. They stumbled, but they didn't fall down. It's not that... That old commercial, I've fallen and I can't get up. <laughs> because God was working. He was grafting the Gentiles in to receive the riches of the Jewish heritage, but he also kept a remnant of Israel. That remnant would be saved, will be saved, and it continues. God will never forsake mm -hmm. Israel, no matter what. God said, it's on me on God. He did not say it was dependent on Israel, on her performance. No. He declared that he would keep her a people, he would keep her a nation, and he would fulfill his promises to her, and he would do it forever. <laughs> we see that in our prophet Isaiah again, chapter 41. We read it in Psalm 89, and even Romans 11, when we get there, is looking toward that. Fast forward with me, though, because I can't give you all of Israel history tonight. I can give you snippets that really show you what Israel's history was like. But I'm going to take you quickly to 1516, to the land of Israel that's become part of the Ottoman Empire until World War I. After this, England gained possession. In, we know this is the Balfour Declaration of 1917, which declared that Palestine, quote, it is not what they're trying to call Palestine today, but this was to be a national home for the Jewish people. The name Palestine, given to this piece of real estate, came by Rome. Rome wanted to wipe out its Jewishness, and in doing so, they made a jab at Israel, and they took from her most ancient enemy, the Philistines. Palestine comes off of that name from the same root. They called the whole area Palestine. They called Jerusalem Alia Capitolina. They made every change they could make to wipe out any Jewishness. The name Palestine mm -hmm. stuck for a time. And so that's why you hear it all the way up to close to uh, 1948, still being referred to in that way. But it, there was a vote that was taken and it was to be called Israel. And that's what God had ordained because he refers to the land as Israel. He does not refer to it as Palestine. Both our original and our New Covenant scriptures prophesied that God would gather the scattered Jewish people from the nations back into this nation once again. And Isaiah, Yeshia, declared that Israel would be born in a day. That was chapter 66, verses 7 and 8. We talked about it last week. We looked forward because Israel was born in a day. And that brings us to the shape of Israel, present that brings us to chapter 10 to look at the present. But this is what took place in 1948. Mm -hmm. This is what we are celebrating. Israel became a Jewish state as a fulfillment of prophecy. God keeps his word. Mm -hmm. 75 years ago, Israel was declared a nation. 
born in a day, and the rejoicing that began. Yet, I have to tell you still, there's a sad part to Israel's history. We're thrilled she's in the land, but she's in the land like Hezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 37 describes. She has dry bones, which means there's not a spirit in her. Though she's in the land in flesh, the spirit is missing. The life within is what is missing. However, again, we see that the scripture tells us God's not through with the Jew. He is reaching to those Jewish people. He's reaching to the nation of Israel today, even though he has called out and is calling out the Gentile people, but formed into what is called the called out assembly or the church. Even though that has been birthed now, Romans 10, 21 says that on the contrary, he, referring to God, stretches out his hands to a disobedient and a contrary people <laughs> all the day long. And that's what's happening right now. They are still disobedient to their God. They're still contrary, but he's still reaching out his arms all the day long. And in keeping with his word, as he spoke through the prophet Jeremia, chapter 30, chapter 31, again, we went through these scriptures last week. God said, I will never make a full end of Israel, that he would make an end of other nations. But as long as we saw the sun, the moon, and the stars, we cannot measure the heavens, that we didn't know the foundations of this earth, that that is proof that God keeps his promises and there will always be an Israel. Way back in that first century time, we see Shaul who becomes Paul. We see him as living proof because he is a Jew who came to believe. And that first century, the believers almost entirely were Jewish. That's why it was the Messianic community. And we know now that the group of Gentiles that God has brought in are to provoke Israel to jealousy. They're to encourage his people to see what they're missing. There is no room here for replacement theology. God is not done with the Jew. He's not replaced the Jew. He's not turned to another people and given them the promises that he promised forever. God is not a liar. And so we come into the future of Israel being secure because God said so. Romans 11 does talk about the future of Israel. It starts out and says, has God cast away his people? Is he done with them? And there is an unequivocal no answer to that question. That's N-O. <laughs> <laughs> By grace. There is a remnant. The blinded in part, yes, that was so the Gentiles could come in. That's the grafting into the root. That's not a replacing. The root is Yeshua Jesus. The root is Jewish. If you're grafted into the root, you're Jewish. Yeah. You come into the Jewishness of it. I don't mean that, that people physically become, but this is a <clears throat> Jewish, it's, this is Judeo Christianity. The Jewishness of Christianity. And it's also very interesting to note that this is contrary to nature. Usually they graft the good into the wild, not the wild into the good. But in ancient time, when a wild olive graft was used on an old olive tree, it reinvigorated both. Yet, what the, was the wild that they said never did produce quite as good olives as the original. <laughs> so I'll warn you, don't boast against the Jewish roots that are supporting you. <laughs> Jewish and Gentile alike are both disobedient, both in need of God's grace. Both had the same opportunity to receive God's mercy, and both are saved on the same principle. And that is grace. Mm. It's the grace of God. It, it's a blessing for the Gentile to receive through the Jew the, the promises, the heritage, the richness. It's not the other way around. God said it was to the Jew first, but also to the Gentile or to the nations. And sadly, our Jewish people do want to claim that special status of our nation. You even hear the leaders of Israel claim the territory according to the description given in the word of God, 
but the reluctant to accept that full responsibility of complete faithfulness and obedience to God. But God still, as I said, made an unconditional promise to his people, and he does not break his promises. God will destroy the nations who attack Israel. And if God can be, if God be for you, who can be against you? Amen. Isaiah 41 tells us that the nations that come against Israel will be brought to nothing. And the Battle of Armageddon, the culmination that we know is the ultimate, is the war that we see on the horizon. We know that it is coming. Revelation 19 is a description especially of the return of Messiah to stop the Battle of Armageddon. But one can gaze into the Armageddon landscape of the Jezreel Valley. They can see where these prophecies will be fulfilled when all the nations of the world will line up to do battle against this hot piece of real estate, <laughs> where currently peace seems to be to escape. But this is where the Prince of Peace will rule. This is where Messiah will return. This is where he will establish his kingdom of peace. And this is where all the nations of the earth will then be blessed through the nation of Israel where the Arab nations want that peace, P-I-E-C-E, -E, called Israel, they will know the peace, P-E-A-C-E, -E, of their Messiah, who will bring fully these blessings as he has promised. Mm -hmm. And that brings the blessings to the Gentiles also. But there is a time coming when the fullness of the Gentiles will come in, and God will continue with his prophetic plan for Israel. And we are told in verse 26 and 27 of Romans 11, that all of Israel shall be saved. That's referring to her in nationally. And that's where God is saying, I established my covenant, God speaking, that he made a covenant with the nation. So he will restore the nation. He will remove their sin. He will fulfill every prophecy. He will establish his earthly kingdom. And it will be with her Messiah sitting on the throne in Jerusalem. Hallelujah. Amen. Messiah will come. He will dwell in her midst. Zechariah speaks to this, chapter 2 in particular. And this time he will not come lowly and riding on a donkey. This time he will come in full splendor. This time we will see him in his regality. We read it in Revelation 19 when he stops the battle and sets up his kingdom. And Matthew 24 also tells us about it. Yet we can go into our original scriptures and see that the king is to set up his kingdom there in Jerusalem, according to our prophet Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 14 also. And Revelation 20 talks about this thousand years of peace, thousand years of shalom mm -hmm. on this earth, amazing. And it comes with Israel as the center, as the head, because Messiah comes to sit on David's throne, on David's throne. He will fulfill what he promised to David, 2 Shmuel, 2 Samuel chapter 7. He will fulfill Yeshia, Isaiah 9, you start with 6, the, the child that's born, the son that's given, but you go into verse 7, and it's the government resting on the shoulders of Messiah. There are so many promises of Israel being the head nation of the world, and God will fulfill them all. It started all the way back in Bereshit in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3, when God said to Abraham, I will bless them that bless you. I will curse them that curse you. Our prophets, all our prophets, Isaiah, Zechariah, these are examples I've given, but they all speak to it. Because you see, Israel has a glorious God plan preserved and premier program for Israel. Mm -hmm. In conclusion, our relationship to Israel in light of her importance, we're seeing Israel as God's time clock. We see over the span of time, God's hand on the land and on the people. The fact that there's still a Jew today is evidence of God's hand. We can go back to Pharaoh in Egypt about 1400 BC to Hamon in the 5th century BC, this is your book of Esther. We can go to Hitler in the 30s and the 40s AD, and we can go to the future battle of the Antichrist. But we've read the final chapter. Israel wins. <laughs> God stirs in the heart of man in relation to accomplishment of his plan with Israel. 
even the Gentile leaders, they're the nations, their tools in his hand. Mm -hmm. It is not that they've got this plan and God has to figure it out. <laughs> this is the hand of God and he's used them through the ages to perform his plan. Remember, God planned overall Israel being a blessing to the Gentiles. Again, I will bless them that bless you. I will curse them that curse you. And we see very clearly that Israel is the apple of God's eye. As Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 2 and verse 8 says, love it. That's the focal point. Now, would you really want to go poke your finger in God's eye? <laughs> or would you rather receive his blessing? Why is this real important? Because God says she's important. Mm -hmm. From beginning to end, it's all about Israel. God moves throughout the ages, throughout time, throughout space to fulfill his plan to Israel. And a walk through this land allows one to walk in the past, see the present, mm -hmm. and view where the future will take place. Mm -hmm. Want to know what's going to happen? Read the book. <laughs> God was, God is, and God always will be on Israel's side. Yes. Israel is the people of God, and with God on her side, who can stand against her? What God promised to Israel will affect Israel, but it also will affect the world. It will affect you, and it will affect me. Remember, bless her, be blessed. Curse her be cursed. And as we see God's faithfulness to Israel, we can be assured of God's faithfulness to us now. It gives us great faith to believe when we see that God is faithful, even with a disobedient and a rebellious people. So no matter what your trial, your tribulation, what you're facing, I'll encourage you to put your faith in the God of Israel, yeah. not in yourself and not in another man, but put it in the God of Israel. Yeah. He will see you through. Amen. He promised he wouldn't let the waters overflow and he wouldn't let the fire scorch. That was given to Israel, but the principle we can see there. So Jew or Gentile, you can be on the winning side. Yeah. Just be on God's side. Yeah. And life's greatest adventure is as you soar hand in hand with the God of Israel. Yeah. I give you the importance of Israel. Woo. That's so many questions. Wow, you have lots of questions. We're going to 